All right, guys, everybody, uh, this is Tim here with Wholesaling PPC podcast, REI Uncovered here. I'm excited to chat with my buddy, Edward Beck. We've been friends for a while here. And full disclosure, he's actually not a client of mine. So this is kind of maybe bad marketing of mine. He's a really successful investor, not using PPC, but he's a friend of mine. He's super successful. And um, as you guys know, with this with this podcast, what I'm trying to do is just bring on different investors with different perspectives and to see how they view the business um, and such. So Ed, thanks so much for having me on and spending some time with me here, amusing me. No, I'm excited. Honestly, I, I, uh, when, when, when you wrote that blog post, it really resonated kind of with my own message. You know, um, I guess I can shamely plug my book, but my book was written way back when, I don't know, 2014 or something like that, 2015. And it was me calling out the industry for selling get rich quick schemes and uh, acting like, you know, real estate is this venue that everybody can get into and nobody can lose money. And, uh, and they just, it's all, you know, just pumping, pumping like this idea that you don't have to do any homework. You just buy my little course and you're automatically going to be rich, you know, just follow this three-step plan. And, um, um, and, 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 and then it was also a lot of it was people selling uh, the, how do I say it? They, they were selling the idea that you can, um, uh, that they were selling ideas that worked prior to 2008. That's probably what I would say. So a lot of the, the, the techniques no longer worked. So I'll give you like a little preference. When, when I first started prior to 2008, like in 04, we would do like, you know, a hundred signs in the streets, right? The bandit signs. And we'd get like 50 calls, right? Now you put out like a thousand signs and you may get five calls. Yep. See what I'm saying? Yep. So um, not only is it that uh, there's there's a million people doing this, right? There's also a, um, uh, there's, an, there's, a, there's an awareness in the realtors Realtors know what a deal looks like now. They know what it sounds like. They know where to take it. Or they have buyers that are begging them for deals. And they can convert those deals faster, mm. better, and even from a better position of authority than a guy on the sign, right? So, like, if you can put yourself in a seller's mindset, you're driving down the street, you see a sign, right? an illegal sign, right? Legally placed sign nine yep. times out of 10. Right. And, and then, and then you call your realtor and your realtor's like, no, I know a, an investor. He buys all the time. Right. Much more credible. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's easier conversion um, than somebody off of a sign. So, you know, the wholesalers, not that it's not a good business to get into, but you got to know what you're buying. You got to know what you're getting into. I would like, let me give you a, a little statistic here is there's more realtors than there is listings currently, right? I'm sure you've seen this st statistic. Yep. That has been the same statistic in wholesaling for probably five years. More wholesalers than there are houses to wholesale. You wonder why there's so many courses out there because in a way it's a better business model, right? There's more wholesalers than actual wholesaling way going better. on. Way better, way better. And if you're not ingrained and you don't like my, my biggest uh, strength was that I built a website, two websites that ranked in Google in the top fold. And uh, so I was getting organic leads and, and then also I had, uh, history in the, in the market locally where people knew me and I would get referrals and repeats and things of that nature. And that kind of uh, gave me an edge over everybody else. So yeah, let's, let's talk about your business a little bit. So people on here who don't know who Ed Beck is, shame on you if you don't know who Ed Beck is, but just in case you don't, um, can you just give a little background of like, you know, what your credibility is, like how long have you, you, you mentioned that you've been in the business is 04, so a lot longer than me and, and probably most of the people listening to this, but kind of give a background of the volume. Are, are you like, what are you doing specifically? Or, you know, maybe even um, the scope of your business, like how successful are you in a way? Like why should people listen? Can you just give an idea of, of that backstory there? 
Yeah, I started in 04 ish uh, with my pops. My pops was in the business since the early 90s or late 80s. And he was back in with like the, you know, the, the VA, you know, foreclosures and things yeah. of that nature, like back in the day. And um, he, he says he was the first person ever to put a bandit sign in El Paso. So, oh, really? The city that I'm in. Yeah. When yeah. I was a kid, I used to go with him. I mean, I was like 15 in the middle of the night and kick over people's signs. Yeah. <laughs> savage. <laughs> True story, right? And if anybody's That's been funny. in the sign game, it's pretty savage, right? Um, but um, in 08, when the market collapsed, my dad lost his whole business, lost everything, and, and went to go start some other business. And I kind of just started from scratch. Um, you know, it, we, we were at a place where we had like 15 employees. And uh, and it ended where it was just me, you know, and I was like the one man band, kind of like Dick Van Dyke in the beginning of uh, Mary Poppins. Right. And I was, you know, putting out signs, answering calls, doing door hangers. And I was just and it was there was there was no business. No, it, it wasn't that there was no sellers. There was no buyers. All the buyers disappeared. Right. Mm. Because, you know, for about two years, nobody wanted to get into the business because it was like. You know, what do they say? Catching falling knives. Nobody know where the bottom was going to be. And if, if you're like right now, you buy a house and people are doing stupid things, flipping houses because they'll buy a house not at the proper margin. So I think a lot of people are learning incorrect um, policies, I guess is a bad word to use, but incorrect uh, systems for how to look at a deal. Bad habits. They're getting bad habits in their business model for flipping properties. Right. The opposite was happening back then. So right now you could buy a house at, you know, 80 cents on the dollar, fix it and flip it because the market's just exploding. Going up. Right. 80 cents on the dollar now is going to be 70 cents on the dollar when you actually sell it. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, but back then, you know, people were buying at 60 cents on the dollar. And scared and nervous, you know, there was areas in my, in, in my city where it was selling in like beginning of 08, end of 07 at like $120 a square foot. And then in 09, 010, it was 75, 70 bucks a square foot, the same exact house. So how much volume would you say that you're, that you like do on average per year? Are you doing five deals a year? Again, a one man show, like how, how much are you in the business here? So um, I'm, I've transitioned a lot more to the actual investing side, even though my business has been wholesaling forever. Wholesaling has always been my, what I live off of. Right. You know? And I'll make that extra money and I'll, and I'll invest it. But uh, 09, um, I think I did, 09, uh, 2019, I did um, like 118, 120 uh, deals, wholesale deals. In uh, 2018, I did like probably a little bit more than that. 2017, I probably did a, like in the 90s. Yeah, um, and that's so you know what you're doing. <laughs> that's a lot. Pretty much there. But in 2020, you know, I'm I'm it. 2020 killed my business. It, it took it to, I think we did like 37 wholesales. Mm. 20 market shifting. Yeah. And in 2021, it doesn't seem like we've turned that corner yet to get back into the regular market. Um, so I don't, you know, I feel like a little bit like, uh, like we were talking before, like that book, who moved my cheese, mm -hmm. like where did the market go? And right. is it, is it going to come back? And, and if it is going to come back, when is it going to come back? So uh, I scaled back my business quite a bit through 2020 um, and, and I'm kind of like a little gun shy now about marketing to mm -hmm. throw money back into the business to get it back. Cause that's one thing that's unique and people don't understand in, in our business wholesaling is you have to spend money to get leads. Right. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could do cold calling, but I'd rather, you know, go work at Walmart. You know what I mean? Like then cold call people randomly. But yeah, you know it's it's interesting. So I, I do want to dive into the market shift a little bit, but we'll we'll circle back to into it. So it what it it confuses me a little bit to hear you say like, 
hey, you know, last year was kind of a, kind of a harder year for the business. Um, things are shifting because when I go online, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, to me, it looks like everybody is doing 100K assignments all day long, all the time. And and I'm not doing that. I even pivoted my business last year a little bit. I've, I'm have i doing the agency more than my wholesaling business at this point, as, as most people know. Um, but it's very contradictory to a lot of things that I see on social media. So, so if I go on YouTube and I type in real estate investing, probably the top five results are going to be how I made, you know, $10 million last week, or maybe not that extreme, but you know what I'm talking about. And then I, um, Facebook groups, I see all the time, just like people posting big checks, big checks. And I'm, I'm not saying they're lying at all, but, but for me, it's a little bit of a disconnect. So let me ask you this. When you see people like, when you see all this stuff on social media, I mean, do you think a lot of it is accurate? What do you, what do you have to say about those kinds of posts and the frequency of them? Honestly, I, I've, I've always, I've always thought that uh, our, our business is full of, uh, I don't know, posers. <laughs> so our business is full of posers, you know what I mean? And, and, and honestly, it's hard not to like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, when we first met at Carrot Camp, um, I went there and, and I felt like I was like one of the bigger guys in the room and I spent most of my time somewhat bragging. And I remember when I was flying back home, I was like, man, I just spent all this time and I got nothing out of it because I couldn't get out of my own head, right? Mm. And uh, so I, I made it a point to go back with a different mindset of a mindset of uh, learning and, 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 and gaining knowledge from other people. And I had a better uh, carrot camp at the second round, you know, just being transparent. Um, but honestly, I think a lot of people, A, a lot, first thing, I think a lot of people are posers. B, I think a lot of people are doing all these creative type real estate deals that will eventually bite them in the butt. You know, they're getting the money today and it's very short-sighted, which is kind of, unfortunately, the millennial mindset. Mm. It's very short-sighted. No, no offense taken to that. Yeah, yeah, no, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> present, present, uh, present company excluded, right? Uh, but um, I think, I think this, it, it is, and it's not even just the millennials. It's also just the American mindset. It's the microwavable mindset. It's the and, and the, the way I like to use it as an analogy is um, in a field. You have your field of your, of your life, right? And you can plant cotton in your field, right? And, or, you, or you can plant trees, right? If you plant cotton, you'll get that harvest within that year. But the next year, you have to go and plant again. Right. right? It doesn't stay there. You have to grow it all down and build it back up. But if you plant a tree, you're not going to get a harvest for maybe like 10 years. But at the end of those 10 years, now you don't have to water as much. You don't have to deal with it as much. And it's just a continual harvest, right? You don't have to replant. You don't have to, you don't have to do as much. And I think everybody in the millennial is so short-sighted that all they want to do is just plant cotton rather than plant some trees in their life, you know? Mm, you know, I was... Um... Ironically, there was a good Facebook post the other day. Um, it, someone did some some research, um, and he basically went through like a lot of the big real estate investing podcasts, and he reached out to a lot of the um, interviewees on there. And I think he talked to like four hundred of them, and he he basically was following up with them post interview because you know the interviews they all have a big story about you know this big deal they did or, or whatever. And I'm, I don't quote me on the stats here, but it's something like 3% of them are um, ended up quitting their job and like pursuing it full time. 70% of them aren't even in the business anymore. And then the rest of them are probably kind of stabilized where they are. So to me, you know, I, I can't say like if one person is going to succeed or not, but just if you look at it on a macro level, like a lot of these stories that we see of people crushing it, um, they may, there's always a new person, right? You never see the same person on the interview two years later because of, for that reason. So what do you think about that? Does that sound accurate to you? Cause to me, I'm not surprised by that at all. No. And, and I, I would even go as far as to say that probably 95% of the people that flip houses lose money, 95%. And they all lie about it. They all lie about it. Like, let me, let me give you an, uh, uh, 
a, a, an example. So you, you talked about people posting checks, right? So, yeah, a whole bunch of time. So um, you go to these Facebook group and the guy will post a check and it'll be a 40, 50 grand or 60 grand or 100 grand or whatever it is, right? And, uh, but they don't know, A, how many payments they made, B, how much they paid in utilities, C, how much they paid their contractor, B, how much they put down when they bought the property. All these are costs. So yeah, they could show a check of 50 grand, but they could have lost 20. You know, they could put a check for 50 grand, um, but they made two, right? Right. You don't actually know it's all net and you can't, you can't show net, net income off of a check. It's like hard to yeah. visualize that. You can't. And then I'm not going to trust your check. You know what I mean? Now, right. a wholesale check is a little different, you know, right. uh, but, um, you know, we don't know what these checks actually mean, you know? It could be a so, loan. Yeah. You don't really know. <laughs> You know, it's just, and they're, they're blocking, like, we don't know the story. We don't know the truth. And, and, and honestly, I think, uh, I think people are, are wanting to, A, prove to them, their friends, their family, because when you step out of the box of the nine to five job, everybody is, is pulling you back to normal. So it's very much like if you get a glass of really cold water, this is not cold water. But if you get a glass of really whiskey, cold, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's actually, look at it, it says Texas does it better. So sorry. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you have this cup and it's really cold water, water droplets will accumulate on the outside, right? And people are always like, yeah, the water is seeping through. The water is not seeping through the glass. What it is, is, is the water on the outside is coming there to try and warm up the cup to be a neutral temperature, to bring it back to regular temperature. And that's somewhat of what society does. You know, your friends, your family and stuff like that. So this is kind of their way to combat this in their life is they have to prove it that what they're doing is not stupid and, mm. they, and, and they're making money. So mommy and daddy and, you know, your cousin um, doesn't um, judge you. Right. And doesn't doesn't make fun of you at the barbecue. Right. Or the Thanksgiving dinner. And and, and I and I understand that I empathize with that. But uh, the truth is, is that I think it's very hard to be transparent in this business. It's very much Gary V. He's kind of the guy that uh, talks about it. You know, it's just let the let the let the story play out and people will follow you more for transparency than they will for you never having any mistakes. Mm. You know? Right, right. Yeah, I get that. I get that 100%. So um, so if I'm listening to this this podcast here, watching the interview on YouTube or, or whatever, and I'm, uh, let's say, a newbie, okay, and I'm, I'm looking to get my first deal. Let's say I've been in it three months. I've been, you know, absorbing all the YouTube content that I can. I've been, um, you know, struggling, cold calling. Like I don't have very much money, which is probably why I'm trying to get into it in the first place. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, 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 I'm seeing a lot of people posting checks on Facebook and it, it's making me feel bad a little bit because like, I don't like how, what do all these people know that I don't know? How is everyone making six figures every week? And I, and I can't even get my first deal. So what, what would you tell, what would your advice be to someone like that and how, how they can make it? Or what would you tell them if they were your mentee? Honestly, I would tell you never, don't quit your job. Don't quit your job, you know? And, and it's very much uh, counterintuitive uh, because a lot of these guys, they quit their job and it's somewhat like what they say is you burn the ships, right? So you right. force yourself to do it. But um, especially if you have a family you have obligations, you have bills, you know, honestly, it's doing a disservice to people. If you don't have the, the gusto to pull in those after hour work hours and, and put in the work to make this business successful, then you, you're, you're probably not made out for entrepreneurship. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, most people are just their mindsets are not in a place where they can deal with being an entrepreneur. Just what do you mean by that? Like what specifically do you think people, people get stuck with? Honestly, it's, it, 
they're, they think that, you know, we're sitting up here smoking cigars, kicking back, you know, just ordering people, hey, go do this, hey, go do this, hey, you know. And uh, they don't know the level of stress and the level of uncertainty and the level of uh, questions that come to mind when you're, when you're dealing with um, a business, you know, and then the, the, the swings, you know, there's been months, like during COVID, there was like six months I had no income. That's stressful. You know what I mean? And, and, and my, my, you know, when you go from making, you know, $850,000 a year to no income, now you, you've been tested in fire of being an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and most people, they'll change their lifestyle up to their new income, right? I'm making 850, I should drive, you know, a Range Rover and have a gold Rolex, you know what I mean? And, um, uh, but the truth is, is that, you know, you have to, uh, you have to match, you know, like, like I heard somebody say the, uh, I forgot who it was, is divide up the last five years of your income. And then that's what you should live off of. Mm. Take your life on that, not on just one good year. You know, and and uh, you know, I, not, not saying that I'm the best example to 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 tell people to do it because you know I fall into that trap too. But um, people, some people just they're not they don't have it they don't have it. You know, whatever that entrepreneur gene, that angry dog, you know that that growl. You know what I mean? Yeah, the and, fight. Yeah, if you don't have that growl or like, mm, it's not going to push me around. I'm going to go out there and, and and kick it into that next gear to push through this. Then, then yeah, you know, you can test the water and see what you got. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it, it's just, I, if you ever read the book Outliers? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Super good, good book. book, super good book. And, and, and it, there's, there's a... There's a part in there where he talks a lot about people that went through struggles and that's what made them successful or learning disabilities, right? So it's almost what makes you strong is trouble, stress. That's what makes you strong. It's very much like a sword. You ever seen people make samurai swords, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the stronger they make the samurai sword is the more times that they put it in the fire and then put it in the water. Put it in the fire and put it in the water. It's tempering the. the I love sword. that. And the more times you can you can deal with getting in the fire and not breaking, right? Because sometimes it, it'll break if you do it too many times. It'll break. And the more times you, you could do it, the stronger that steel is, right? So what I'm hearing from this basically is like, this business is not easy. It's not meant to be easy. And if I'm getting started in it, you know, doesn't mean don't do it at all. It obviously, like, if you want to go for it, definitely go for it. But just understand a lot of the information that you see online, they're not going to tell you it's hard because it's hard to sell a course with that kind of messaging. You know what I mean? But selling a course is like, hey, you can do this. It's, it's, there's a great lifestyle and they, they kind of make it seem maybe easier than it actually is. So I feel like a lot of people getting into the business have this, like you said, get rich quick mentality because it's sold as being easy because that's how you sell courses, but it's actually not easy. And that's our point. It's not that you shouldn't do it, but that the point is it will be hard and you should expect it to be hard. And you, and you should really try to, and this is a lesson I've been learning recently. You should really try to work on yourself. And like when you can handle the stress, that's when you ultimately will be successful, you know, infinitely for the long run, improving that ability. What would, what would you say, Ed, is your greatest strength as a business person that's allowed you to succeed over the years when others have, have crapped out? I'm a grinder. I'm a grinder. I don't mind it. I kind of enjoy it. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you, know, you have to enjoy it in a way in the business. If you don't like it, then you're going to be miserable all the time because it's such a grind. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of people don't like it. You know, I have, I've had many people that I've partnered with in real estate deals. And they're like, I don't know how you're doing what you're doing. They don't understand mm. it. They don't get it. You know what I mean? They're like, I don't know how you could do all these things, you know, where you're fixing 10 properties, you're wholesaling eight, and uh, and then you're writing a book at the same time. 
you know, they're like, I don't know how you're doing all this. And you have, you know, I got three kids, I've got a wife, you know, how do you, how do you balance all that? Right. And, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I like the grind. I like it, you know, and it, I heard my pastor tell me one time, he said that your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. And, um, and so my ability to um, be stubborn, right, is, is, is my strength, but it's also my weakness, right? So sometimes the stubbornness prevents me from pivoting, you know, and uh, pivoting from, say, marketing sources, changing gears as much, because I'm so in tune with, hey, row, you bastard. Right. You know what I mean? And, but the, that's what I would say. That's my strength. I see that, you know, I, my, my favorite saying with, because I don't know if, if you ever got into it where you're in a local level and there's like computers, you know, your competition yeah. your level and they, and you know, you, the, you'll hear from this guy, Hey, this guy said this about you. And this guy said this about you. I had a guy that I mentored here because I mentored like 25 guys in my city. And I had a guy that I mentored and he laughed and he would always put on social, I don't need no guru or whatever. Right. And, uh, and I would always say, whenever they would say that, I was like, let's see where he's at in five years. You know what I mean? Like he can say what he wants. Let's see where he's at in five years. If he's still in the game, you know, and if he is, I'll, I'll give him props. You know, he can say whatever he wants. Like, uh, I don't hold on any ill will, but it comes down to that, you know, uh, sustainability that 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 ability to push through adversity you know critical thinking those kind of things you can't learn in a book you can't learn in a course you know um where i'll, I'll give you i'll give you an example there's there's been many times where i was in wholesaling and i'd come home from work and the lights would be turned off in my house true story i come home my wife's like, my wife's like, the, the power's out. I was like, what happened? And she's like, well, I don't know, you, you know. And I forgot to pay the bill or, or whatever, right? Wow, yeah. And, and um, so I'm scrambling to pay, you know, whatever, because I'm floating money, right, to, to do certain things. And I'm so uh, vision-focused, so forwardly focused, I don't look at the day. And I'll just go all in every hand. I'll just like, I'm in, I'm in all hand, you know? And, um, and a lot of people just not made for that, bro. Mm -hmm. Not made for that. You know, hey, break out the candles. I'll fix it tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's true. Or hire a personal assistant. <laughs> I feel yeah. at that point, you know, <laughs> maybe that'd be an option for you. Yeah, but I'm just saying like, like sometimes that, that struggle is, it's real. You know, there's times where you're like, I don't know how I'm going to pay the contractor this week. I uh, went over budget and I got to finish this project and I'm short 10 grand and I don't have it. Right. That's real. That stuff happens all the time. You know, when you're just in so many deals, you know, like I'm in, I'm in a, I'm in a big apartment complex that I'm remodeling right now and we're over like 20 grand in our budget. Right. And uh, you know, so Got to come up with 20 grand, you know, you know, go work the streets for money, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and, and you're like, okay, where am I going to get this from? You know, and those are the, those are, that's what entrepreneurship is. Very, I heard somebody say, I think it was, uh, what's that comedian that has the, the family feud? What's his name? Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey. He said, he said entrepreneurship is like jumping off a cliff and building a parachute on the way down. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and he's like, yeah, you, you're not going to know until you, until you're in the middle of what, what's going to be needed of you. Right. Mm. And, and if you don't have that, that ability to say, Hey, I can deal with it. You know, I can, I can overcome it. I can, I can take a couple hits, you know, take that, take that guy sending you, uh, Hey, I need, I need to check on Friday. I'm like, I'm not going to have it till next week. bro. You're going to have to wait. Mm. And, and you got to eat crow, you know, you, or, or like we say here in El Paso, you got to eat your sopa. So mm. sopa is like, like your, your soup before your meal. Right. And it's like, it's like, you gotta, 
you gotta you gotta deal with it. You gotta take the punches. And um, a lot of times, I just don't see it in them. I don't see that that oomph, that fire, that that intangible in people that will give them the sustainability to get past this ten years. You know? Yeah, I I love that, and I'm. I'm all about the the long term. Like, what are you going to do to succeed? Not just this year, but in five years and ten years, right? Mm-hmm. And there's so many people that crap out of the business. It's important. Don't assume that just because you know how to, you got your first deal done, that you're going to make it. Like, don't don't assume that because there's a lot of people who do get a handful of deals done who still crap out of the business. It's not all about the first deal. Um, so I approach the business. What I'm hearing, um, and I 100% agree with, is approach the business from a long term mindset right? That's ultimately what you're going to do to succeed. And uh, one way to do that to make it easier on yourself is to keep your job. If you have a full-time job or a part-time job, keep it because you can do deals on the side. If you're not willing to do a full-time job and a part-time job or two full-time jobs, you shouldn't be in this business. You shouldn't be in entrepreneurship at all, right? So make it easier on yourself. Don't, you know, humble yourself a little bit. Keep a side income because it will get difficult. There, there will be ups and Ed's very successful. He knows how to do deals. And still there are periods where he didn't have income coming in. And it's so important. And, and same for me. It's so important to have side income so you can handle it. And we're, we're looking at five years and 10 years, not, not one month. Don't burn the bridges. Maybe works for the first three months, but it's not going to work for five years. You know, um, so yeah, that being, yeah, go ahead. Honestly, I think that if I had to do it again, I might do a different road because I've been full time for 16 years, you know, and I know the strain that is put on my marriage. I know the strain that is put on my family. I know the, the you know, and it's like this trade off. Right. And and I don't know, you know, the, God will tell me maybe on the other side. Right. But I don't know. I don't know the solution. I don't know the answer. Yeah. But, the, you know, if you know you've got it in you. Right, you know, most people know, and um, you can try it. You know, go for it. But I would say, you know, a lot of times there's a saying that says um, um, that you know the, the worst place to be is um, unconscious incompetence. So, like, you're not even aware that you're not aware. Like, you don't even know what you don't know. And and if you've never been in this business, you've never been in any business, right? You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Mm. And, 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 and this gives you like floaties, you know, you don't know how to swim yet. So let me give you some floaties and you can jump in the water, you know, and, and save yourself a lot of heartache and pain. Um, but if you want to, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to swim with no floaties and you never swam before. Yeah. Jump in the deep end. Go for it. Let's see if you can survive, you know. And maybe that's that's the way you learn how to swim. But true, everyone yeah. has their own different path, right? So, I we'll wrap this up here in a minute. But I know we've been like I try to be. Um, people call me negative. People call me cynical because there's so much positivity out there, and it, it is warranted. But I think there's too much, and I'm trying to like average it out in a way. So I kind of have to be like the polar opposite. But on the flip side, so you have seen a lot of success. What does that look like? What is like the life of a successful a real estate investor or real estate wholesaler look like? Like, What are some of the benefits of it? What would a good day-to-day be like? I mean, you've worked hard. There are benefits of it to making that much money. Can you tell me like what that lifestyle is like? You know what? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat stupid in, in regards where, um, like, like I was saying before, I keep going back in. If I would have just settled down, you know, five years ago, I wouldn't have to work really. And um, so there's a point where you're like, I can't buy any more properties. I'm not going to buy any more properties. It's almost a sickness, you know, I'm not going to buy any more properties until I finish these ones until I think, and then the deal comes and you're like, mm. you know, you're like that crack kid. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, but it's very true. Like, like, honestly, I, 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 you know, I could be driving a Lambo and living in twice a big house and, you know, doing these different things. If I would just, um, you know, not, not consistently keep reinvesting, keep reinvesting, keep reinvesting and pushing that envelope to a point where uh, I get it there. But this year, honestly, through COVID, I got, 
I had all this time, right? I was sitting around doing nothing, you know, and there's only so much Netflix you can watch. So I was like, I did a lot of soul searching. I read a really good book, Profit First. Yes. Yeah. I love that book. We Okay. We could go into that. I read that book as well about a year ago and it's changed my business. Profit yeah. First, probably the best book you can read. Yes. Profit First. And I got turned on to the author by uh, Trevor, Trevor Mock. He, he turned me on to Pumpkin Plan, which was one of his previous books. And I've read pretty much all his books now. And he's a hilarious writer. But um, so I, I, I kind of forced myself, I forced my business into this profit first mentality. And then I, first, I forced my investments into a point. So at the end of this year, um, had everything finishing, all my projects finishing, I'll be out of the rat race this year, you know, and, um, and I'm forcing myself not to buy anything else. Honestly, it's not a good time to buy anyway. Um, it's it's too, so hard to get a property that that uh, cash flows properly. Like I, I've sold 10 properties in the last two years that I was holding rentals because people are just paying stupid amounts. Like I sold, I sold duplexes at like four and five cap rates. And mm. I'm like, how can I say no? Like, this is like, we're, we're okay. Like if you want to buy it, you know what I mean? I didn't have to fix it. It wasn't nice. It was a rental. You know what I mean? And they were buying them at four and five cap rates, which is like, okay, like if that's what you want, you know, and, right. and it's all these guys that are on, you know, bigger pockets with this burr mentality where they're going to live in one side and rent out the other. But they're just, they're so hard to find is duplexes, quadruplexes, triplexes. So they were just overpaying for it. So I was like, I'm not going to argue with you. If you want to live next to you know, your renter, go for it. Enjoy, you know, I'm not doing that. Right. Yeah. Um, but um, I'll tell you this though, on, on paper, super, super like I've, I've got like, I don't know what my net worth is, is probably over 8 million. Um, Jeez. But, yeah. But um, in, in my day to day, I know, let me tell you this, and maybe this will help you guys because most people are entrepreneurs are like me. At least that's what I find. And our weaknesses is we're, we're generally undisciplined. We're high risk takers. We're loose with money, big spenders, big tippers, right? We know we're like flamboyant, outgoing personalities. This is like, like if you had a picture of what a wholesaler looks like, it looks like, like, looks like a Beck. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like this guy, you know what I mean? With freaking greasy hair. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, and um, so I know myself, you know, uh, and I know that I'm like that. So I forced myself to buy more properties so that it didn't spend it, right? Because I would have just blown it, right? It would have been sitting in my bank account and I would have been like, okay, let's go to Paris. Let's go to Italy. Let's go, you know, not that I'd like travel because I'm, I'm a Gen Xer. We don't travel. And um, so... That's, that, that's kind of one of those techniques that I use to uh, force myself to be more disciplined is if you get yourself into another project, you'll have to find that money and not, you know, live on, live on RAM and, and put that money in there so that you don't spend it, right? Mm -hmm. So it forced myself to live below my means, right? So that I, I could accumulate properties. And, and, I, and I, I've been accumulating mainly because I felt like inflation was coming. You know, I'm a big Robert Kiyosaki fan. I read all like 30 of that. He's probably got like 16, 17 books. And I've read most of them. I can't say all of them. And, um, he, and he always talks about inflation coming, right? Inflation, inflation, inflation. So I've been betting on it for years. And now it's crazy to see it finally coming around, you know, and, and, and you know, this whole time, like, I was like, man, when is this inflation going to happen? You know, I, like you would see this stuff happen and then the, like COVID and then they just throw millions of dollars, trillions of dollars at, at everybody. It's like direct inflation now. So I think that's the big thing I would say is that if you, if you know what you're good at, know your weaknesses, know your strengths, build your, your business or your investment career around it because nobody got into wholesaling 
put out signs and make calls. All day. Everybody, got, yeah, everybody got into wholesaling to buy property and get cash flow. Mm. That's the goal, right? And hopefully. If not, why, why don't you go become a stockbroker? You make, make way more money just, you know, being a stockbroker. Um, go get your Series 7, you know, and you make or go become a mortgage officer. Those guys make good money, right? Like, don't, why would you want to be a job? Yeah. Why would you want this job? Like this job is not that glamorous. You know, you, you, you know, it, 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 the only reason that you get this job is because you get access to deals. That's mm -hmm. the purpose. That's the great part of this business is that I get a first look before anybody else does. And if I want that deal, I'm going to get it. I love that. Yeah. And that's something I could probably work on. I mean, I've never taken title to a property. I've always been in the, the wholesaler mindset, not in the wealth building mindset. So that's something that even, you know, my journey has been going through and just a couple of points you, you threw a lot out there and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish it up here. But um, basically you were saying like your lifestyle here is not that different. Like you're, you're still a grinder at heart. And I, I find similarities with a lot of successful people. It's, it's like the irony of life in order to get to that level of success, you have to develop the mentality of like kind of always grinding, almost seeking the pressure, seeking the stress, the stress. And then when you are successful, you're already that way. You can just keep doing it in a way. So like you to get to the point of being successful, you almost don't even like in, enjoy it or you don't even use it as much. It's like ironic. You agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I think you'd have to, you have to change your mindset. I had I have a, a really rich partner. He inherited a bunch of money. Well, he's going to inherit a bunch of money from his dad. His dad was one of my partners before. And we were doing a bunch of deals together. We still have a big portfolio together. And, and I remember him sitting me down and he's like, he's like, you, you still act like you're running the streets, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he's like, you don't have to act like that anymore. He's like, you, you, you have, your mentality is no longer, you don't need that mentality anymore, you know? Mm. And and, and he's, and he was hundred percent correct, you know, and it's something that I, that always resonates in the back of my head is like, Hey, I need to change my mindset from, um, you know, climbing the mountain, you know, versus to, being on the top of the mountain, you know, right, right. right. And, right. But at least you have the option to, to have that mindset if you ever need, like you, like, I don't disagree. Like you can get rid of it, but it's always good to have that skill set in your back pocket. If you ever need to turn it back on. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, there was times where like the last five years where I was like, Oh, I got to come up with 20 grand. And I'm like, I can figure it out. I'll right. figure it out. You know, cause I've done that many, many, and many, many times. And uh, a lot of people, they just don't like, like if they were approached and they were like, I'll give you another example. That same partner um, at the end of 2019, he sends me a text message. Hey, we got to pay our taxes on our properties. It came out where we got to pay 17 grand something like that and he's like we need a check in two weeks <laughs> i was like Ugh. you, mean, bro? Oh, you know? man. so stressful you know to 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 a person that's very liquid it's not a big deal but to me who constantly keeps going in mm -hmm. uh, liquidity is very hard to come by right and and generally most of the liquidity is coming from wholesaling right so yeah, you got to figure out a way like, oh, crap, I got to get I got to get down there and I got to figure out a way to go work these streets and get some money. And um, and, you know, it's fine. We figured it out, whatever. But those are the kind of uh, situations that people just are not ready for. They're not ready for that. Technique. And you still deal with it now. Like you've you've earned your right to not have to deal with that honestly, mm -hmm. but you still, you still do it anyway. And it's partially a choice. I mean, things come up, you're right, but like it, it is something, it's a skill set that you will need the rest of your life. Like life will never be. And it's something I've, I've been, I was spoiled growing up. So this is a lesson I've been learning over the, my wholesaling journey is like life will never be easy. Like wholesaling isn't meant to make your life easy and you just need to accept it. And, and you need to be better. Don't wish your life was better. You become better, you yeah. know? And I didn't know what that meant. And now I do. And I just want to go back to an earlier point you said of like build a business based on on your lifestyle and I'm not telling everyone that you know they need to go 
buy a bunch of properties and like grind all the time and work the streets like Ed when, when you've made it. But I think there is something to be said for building your business around who you are. And just to share my example here, um, I run a PPC agency that the avatar that, that Ed gave about the typical wholesaler is not me. I'm not like the sales guy. I'm, I don't, you know, I don't have any hair grease, you know, I don't do any of that. You know, I'm, I'm not the, the slick guy. You don't see me on social media very much, but I am very like a back, back of the computer, like analyzing number crunching type of person. That's, that's who I am. And, and I adjusted my business because I wasn't super happy in the wholesaling industry, but I really like the marketing of it. I like online marketing. So I, I didn't have to, but I intentionally shifted my business to, to doing a pay-per-click agency because it worked for me. So this is me living as a, as example of, build your business based on your lifestyle and and you can be creative about it, it doesn't have to be wholesale or bust so and you know that's what's one thing that's great about wholesaling is you meet so many people and they do so many different things you know like i met so many people i'm like what do you mean you do that and then they're like yeah that's what i've done for 30 years i say i didn't even know that was a job or a business <laughs> like, you meet people they do so many random things you know and and you can make money out of anything i've met some of the richest people and they were doing, like, I'll give you one story and we'll close with that. Also, I want to plug my, my book. Oh, but, yes. Um, my dad, he tells this story. It was not my story. And he says that somebody came into their office. It was a government homes, right? And uh, they were selling, you know, government repos. And he's like, he came in and he had a janitor's suit on, right? Like an outfit, like he was a janitor at a local school. And he's like, hey, I want to buy one of your properties. And, and he's like, okay. And he gave him a list. And he's like, okay, I like this one. Uh, I'd like to see it. I'm going to make a, an offer on it. So he, he goes, sees it, comes back. He says, yeah, I'll, I'll pay you this much. And he's like, okay, how, how much, where are you going to get the money from? And, and he's like, um, he's like, I'm not going to finance it. And he's like, what do you mean you're not going to finance it? And he's like, yeah, I'm just going to pay cash. He's like, did you inherit money? Did you, you know, something like what happened? And he's like, he's like, what do you make a year? And he's like, oh, I make like 26 grand a year or something. And, 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 and the guy's like, ask me if I have other income. And he's like, yeah. He's like, do you have any other income? He's like, yeah, I've got 15 uh, paid off rental properties. And, and my dad was like, he like moves the paper away. He's like, okay, tell me what you've done, <laughs> right? Like, how did you do what you did? And, he, and the story is that every year he would get his tax return. He would go, he would put it down on a property and buy it, fix it and rent it. And that's what he did every year with his tax return. Wow. Simple thing. And it was, you know, 15 years ago. And every year he would do that. And it got to a point where his rental income started paying off the properties. And then he was able to uh, now just collect cash. Yeah, retire infinitely. That's financial freedom right there. That's amazing. Not a glamorous story at all, but hey, it works, right? Yeah, and you would never expect it. This this janitor, which is a regular job, you know, and a normal, you know, nine to five. And, and my dad even asked him, he told him, he's like, Did you, why are you still working? And he's like, because I enjoy what I do, you know? And he's like, he's handyman, so he knows how to fix properties. So when things break, he goes and fixes them. And it's not glamorous, you know, he's not on TikTok dancing or talking about go get them, you know, or whatever. And, but that's what all these people in this group, all these people on, you know, these Facebook groups want is what that old man figured out. And it's just, he waited, you know, they're not willing to wait 15, 16 years to build up that net worth to have it actually work for him, you know? Mm. And, and now he doesn't have to work. He gets to work, you know, mm. and, wow. and just a normal dude, man, just a normal dude, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing amazing. Just, he just did it. You know what I mean? Maybe it's time that we change our mindsets for that guy to have a long, long, long-term mindset versus how do I get rich next year and buy the Lambo that I want, you know? So great story, man. Do you want to shamelessly plug your book here at the end? Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me ask you this. I'll set you up. Ed, what's the reason you didn't need to do this? Why'd you write a book? It was mostly out of anger. 
um, mostly out of anger and, and uh, was just upset with everything that was happening to my industry. You know, you kind of take ownership of what you do. So, so somewhat like if, if somebody was in the PPC world and doing black hat stuff, mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you shake your fist at them, you know, yeah. like, give us a bad name. And that's the same thing in, in my business. I felt like people were just, you know, selling, you know, uh, snake oil um, and, and hurting people. And then also on top of that, when they were teaching people how to negotiate with sellers, they were doing it from a place of uh, insincerity. And uh, when you get in this business for a long time, you, you learn that the business is not so much about the investor as it is about the seller and is about their situation and how you're able to help them out of it. Because you're dealing with people in the worst situation in their life and everybody wants to know why, ah, how can I close them? Give me new closing techniques and all this stuff. And, 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 and one of the big keys in the book is like, maybe care. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Maybe give a crap about these people because you walk into somebody's house, you know, they're gonna sense your spirit. They're gonna sense your attitude and your disposition. And if you're just there to get money and take advantage and get as, as low as cheap as possible, they're gonna smell it on you. And that's why I close way more deals per lead than anybody else. It's because I care about these people. You know, I want them, I want to help them. I, I don't want I I I I kick people out of my list if they take if they take advantage of the seller or they're rude to them mm -hmm. or they they tell them something like, oh, why did you leave this crap here? You, you, you know, whatever. And uh, to me, I, I see it that way, that it's a, it's a thing that needs to be said that people need to be, people need to look at these sellers in, uh, and with respect, you know, like it was your grandma, right? Like it was your grandpa that everybody's dead. Like all their family leaves them. Like that's the number one story, right? Is like, grandma in a house by herself right mm -hmm. and no family around her to take care of her you go there and the house is a mess like i went to a house a couple days ago and it was an old vet and he was in the house by himself he could barely walk he was like on this little walker thing and this house was a total disaster and he kept apologizing and apologizing and apologizing and i was like dude it's good like don't worry about it like like i mean and then i sit there and talk to him and very little do we talk even about the property. We talk about like, hey, well, tell me about your story. Tell me about your life. Tell me what you used to do for a living. Tell me about this, you know, like, like, like a normal person. Treat them like somebody that you want to talk to because you actually want to talk to them, you know. And, uh, um, and honestly, I think that's what's missing in the industry is a heart, you know. Mm, wow. Yeah. I agreed. Yeah. Compassion is something that you, you have it or you don't, you know, it's like, you can't take a course and for that, but Ed, you know, I, I definitely check out, check out his book for sure. A hundred percent, man. Um, oh, I yeah. think we definitely need that industry it's, perspective. The title is get rich, but not quick. The good, the bad, the ugly of real estate investing. So it's like a perfect plug, right? Get rich, but not quick. And this is why, you know, this is perfect that Ed's one of the first guests on my podcast because we have very similar philosophies. Get rich, but not quick. I can't think of a better way to say how to sum up how to be successful in this business. So thanks so much, Ed, man. I appreciate your time. We, we've we been talking for a while. We'll definitely do this again. This is, this is so much fun. So thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it anytime, man. Take it easy.